If you're interested in what China's doing in Africa and the Global South, you're going to want to subscribe to the China Africa Project. We've indexed every major news story going back years, and it's easily searchable by country, topic, or keyword. Plus, we're the only source for daily analysis on all of the big stories related to Chinese engagement in Africa and throughout the developing world. With a subscription, you'll enjoy full access to the site. Plus, you'll get our popular daily email newsletter that comes out every morning at 6 a.m. Washington time. Subscriptions start at just $7 a month for students and teachers and $15 a month for everyone else. To sign up, just go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa-China Reporting Project at Witts University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, just a, before we get started, a quick shout out to all of our new members on Patreon. A very big welcome to everybody who has joined us for these wonderful conversations that we're having now every week. We did some Zoom talks last week. We're going to do some more Zoom talks next week. We also have our Week in Review product that's coming out onto Patreon. So if you want to join this great discussion that we're holding over there, just go to patreon.com slash China Africa Project, and you can join one of the member groups that we have there. So today we're going to be talking about FOCAC. That's the Forum on China Africa Cooperation Summit. The best information that we have is that it will be held at the end of November. The word that we're getting is November 28th and 29th in Senegal. Of course, I put a giant asterisk next to that. There is no official confirmation on the date yet, either from the Senegalese or from the Chinese. So everybody's just kind of guessing. However, we're getting the best indication that something is happening and that the date is coming soon because we know that these things happen when there are a lot of pre-summit activities that start taking place. And in the past week, it has just ramped up. So just over the past five days, six days, let me tell you what's happened. There was the 10th China-Africa Think Tank Forum that opened in Hangzhou this week. There was a five-day China-Africa Youth Festival that was organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That started in Beijing. The first ever China-Africa Students Forum took place last weekend with students from 36 different African countries. And last week on the sidelines of the second Belt and Road Energy Ministerial Conference, there was a China-Africa Energy Forum that included participation from eight African countries. This is typical in the run-up to FOCAX. So that does give you an idea that we are now finally getting close. We also are seeing now some excellent analysis coming out from think tanks, from scholars, uh, even from us. Uh, I previewed five themes that will top the agenda, that we think will top the agenda. You can find that over on our website. Also, our good friend Paul Nantulia at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in Washington. He wrote an excellent article where he focused on the pushback by African civil society and that how that is going to be a factor at the upcoming FOCAC. Also want to draw your attention to China's ambassador to the Africa Union, uh, Liu Yuxi. He participated in an online event this week where he gave an address that was supposed to look to the future of China-Africa relations, but mostly focused on China's past accomplishments on the continent. And in many cases, since the last FOCAC, there were a couple of interesting facts in that speech that I want to focus on with you today. 70% or $42 billion of the $60 billion financial package that was committed at the last FOCAC in Beijing has either been spent or is earmarked for projects. Ambassador Liu also then said uh, 85% of the major initiatives detailed in the 2018 FOCAC action plan have been implemented. Kobus, it's interesting that he said that only 70% of the 60 billion package, so presumably that leaves 18 billion that's still unaccounted for, which is a lot of money that could be going to a lot of good use. So I wonder what's going to happen with those $18 billion. Interestingly, that the brief mention that he made about the upcoming agenda 
It was very broad, but it still provides some insight on what they're going to discuss. So again, we're not getting a lot of information out of Chinese officials. So any little hint that we get is worthwhile. Here's what Ambassador Liu said. The conference will focus on cooperation areas such as health, industrial capacity, regional connectivity. I think that word regional connectivity is their way of saying infrastructure, agriculture, digital sector, environmental military and security, personnel, and skills training. That is a quote from Ambassador Liu from the African Union Mission for the Chinese Government. Also, just this week, the China Foresight Team at LSE Ideas, that's the think tank at the London School of Economics, and also a partner of ours, by the way, published a new paper featuring some of the top China Africa scholars from around the world who gave their forecasts. This is an absolutely excellent read, And a great primer for those of you who might be new to some of the issues and to the subject. Uh, Some of our old friends, Ushan Wu, Chris Alden, Lina Ben-Abdallah, and and Mzukisi Ikobo from Vitz University are all among those who contributed to this paper. I'll put links to all of these papers in the show notes below so you guys can check them out. Kobus, this year's summit is going to be super important, and all of this analysis is going to help us frame what's going on, simply because it seems that China's priorities today are are really in the midst of changing, and so understanding what the terms of the debate are going to be especially important. I think so. I think it's it's really important to to take into account how Chinese priorities are shifting, um, not only ra- around financing, which is one of the things that we talked about a lot, but I think also also in some ways geopolitically. Um, but I think it's also really important to see how African priorities are shifting. I think there's, you know, the the debate in Africa around some of these issues have shifted somewhat. Um, and so, for example, you know, I think financing is now a, a more complicated, more fraught issue than I think it at some of the, the previous uh, FOCAC summits. So I think it'll be really interesting to see how the entire conversation shifts. And one of the changes that we're also seeing is that China is now focusing a lot more attention on Francophone countries. That's happening at both the government and the private sector levels. Just this week, Chinese pharmaceutical giant Fosun announced that its first ever regional headquarters in Africa will be located in Ivory Coast, in Abidjan. Uh, Also, the Chinese-owned music service Boomplay is making a huge push into the Francophone market. And we're actually also starting to see a much higher profile from uh, French-speaking Chinese diplomats in countries like uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where Zhu Jing now is in the news almost every day. So we're starting to see a higher profile of Francophone countries in the China-Africa agenda. And now a lot of those Francophone countries are concentrated in West Africa, including Senegal, where the summit will take place. And there's a fascinating new paper that was published last month by your institute, Kobus, Saya, and looks at the future of Africa-China relations with insights from West Africa. It was written by Folesha de Sule, who's a senior research associate at Oxford University's Blavatnik School of Government. And we are thrilled to welcome Folesha de back to the show again. A very good afternoon to you, Folesha de. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you back. And we've been looking forward to having you on the show because we've been following a lot of your research that you've been doing with Afrobarometer and what you've been doing here with Saya. Uh, you wrote that the summit is going to take place in a region where a number of countries are operating in what you called a multi-crisis environment. How are the priorities for West Africa, based on the research that you did there, especially in Francophone countries, really distinct from those of other states on the continent? Well, I would say that when you look at um, symmetry, generally speaking, symmetry not only in the region but in Africa, there's a tendency, um, there's a general pattern, you know, from one summit uh, to another to make all the topics that are covered more lengthy, I would say, Uh, meaning that there's a progressive inclusion of additional thematics of mutual interest. And so what I wanted to do with this paper is to have this, uh, this focused on West Africa and try to make a forecast on what will be discussed at the next uh, China-Africa summit that will take place in Dakar. And this is, I would say, both an easy and hard uh, exercise. Easy because uh, I 
what was discussed in the previous agendas and roadmaps that you mentioned earlier will most likely be discussed again in order to assess the progress that has been made, the evolution. But forecasting is also hard as well, especially in terms of the priorities uh, that will be discussed. At these summits, the the topics are uh, very general um, and multiple. Uh, and that's why the, for the purpose of this paper, I decided really to use a more inductive or bottom-up approach by investigating which topics and thematics uh, will be key priorities for West African governments, but also non-state actors, you know, the private sector, civil society, ordinary citizens, um, and so the paper focuses on these priority thematics that came out, that are health cooperation, especially in this pandemic context, but also economic recovery and resilience and how China could contribute to Africa's and West Africa's economic transformation agenda and the question uh, related to debt. And so this doesn't mean that um, other thematics won't be discussed, you know, like digital cooperation, security, environment, climate change, these will all be discussed as well. But um, it's important to integrate that these thematics are more or less uh, interconnected, interdependent. You can discuss about economic recovery in the West African context and uh, China's contribution to it without talking about the digital economy, uh, security dimension, sustainable development, uh, and also the green economy more generally. Is there anything specific to West Africa, though, that is different, say, from the rest of the continent? Well, uh, I would say in terms of this inter connection uh, and this interdependence, I think it's stronger in some of the West African countries when you take countries uh, in the Sahel, for instance, that are, as you, you mentioned earlier, uh, they are you know, facing, uh, they are evolving in a multi-crisis uh, em environment. There, there are many things going on in terms of uh, economic uh, distress, uh, security dimensions, and also they are just like any part of the world uh, affected by the pandemic. And so what is particular there is that uh, you know, this multidimensional uh, approach will maybe be more important, uh, and at least from the interviews that I got in countries like Burkina Faso, uh, countries like Mali, uh, but also more and more in countries like Togo, uh, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, that are increasingly being affected, you know, uh, who, let's say they were relatively spared by terrorist threats, and now they're increasingly facing uh, these um, the, these threats in, in the region. And so they might be, or they are asking for a better inclusion of this aspect. And if I take maybe more concrete examples, um, in, uh, in Burkina Faso, for instance, you know, there has been an increasing demand for, um, no training, training sessions for uh, Burkina Bay civil servants, uh, you know, in, in, in security training, uh, but also when you look at digital surveillance uh, in countries like uh, Cote d'Ivoire, but also Benin, China, but also other countries like Turkey more recently are becoming uh, key strategic partners in, uh, in, for, these, for addressing these issues. Your work, you know, frequently includes a lot of a lot of discussions with with policymakers in in West Africa, um, and you've done also done a lot of work on on African preparations for these summits and an African kind of agenda setting for these summits. So, could you get an, an impression of of how the kind of agenda setting is ha is going on the African side? Like, are, are they are they kind of happy with the progress they're making? And are they kind of moving together towards towards kind of setting African priorities in this discussion? Hmm. I think it depends on whom you ask. Uh, generally speaking, the preparations that I've seen, and again, I'm looking at it from a West African perspective, uh, they... There are multiple levels, right, from the national to the multilateral level, with the African Union uh, playing a key role, uh, but also uh, regional organizations like ECOWAS. However, uh, most of the input comes from the national 
uh, from the national level, the ministries of foreign affairs, the Asia unit and the diplomats that are in charge of relations with Asia, uh, under which China depends very often. And so they are the ones that would, you know, that usually uh, usually carry the message up to the African Union, uh, also representatives in Beijing. So uh, are they happy about this process? Uh, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that um, it's multi-layered, uh, it, it's multi, multi-level, multi this multi-level approach of integrating the national, regional and continental level. Uh, and I'll get back on the regional level uh, later on. But um, there's the complaints that I received is that this preparedness and uh, you know, setting up the agenda usually happens at a very late stage, meaning a few months before uh, the summit, they are asked to provide you know, all the material very quickly. And this doesn't uh, give them enough time, enough space to gather maybe more, um, more requests or, or integrating a more bottom-up approach. Uh, of the question that should be discussed as well in the agenda. Uh, and so there's where many think that regional organizations, and in the case of West Africa, that would be ECOWAS, regional organizations like ECOWAS could play this role a bit better of integrating all these aspects at a more regional level. You know, uh, and by um, this bottom-up approach, I mean some of the criticism that come from uh, you know, from civil society, from but also f from Chinese uh, ways of operating in all these different projects. And so, uh, what I mean by that is not that this criticism isn't channeled, uh, but uh, it usually it stays at the national level and it doesn't move up. And that's the way it's been from the beginning. It there's no, there's been a call from civil society actors to have more regional coordination with China in order to negotiate more uh, robust deals that benefit the African side more, but it hasn't really happened. And one of the reasons why, and we talked about this with you many years ago as well, is the different negotiating styles from different African countries. And I guess I'm, I'm curious that you're somebody who really is the foremost scholar on African negotiations and the negotiating skills with Chinese stakeholders. What have you seen in terms of change and evolution over the years leading up to this FOCAC? Have African negotiating skills improved? Have the knowledge deficits about China narrowed? Do African countries in West Africa specifically have a clear view of what they want from China going into the summit? Hmm. Well, you know, there have been changes, but again, it's, uh, it, it really depends on, on the country. In terms of the changes that I've seen is that uh, one of the aspects that came out of my uh, 2019 paper was the lack of coordination, the lack of intergovernmental, but also infragovernmental -go coordination, meaning within a single country, uh, there's, there was not always coordination between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Finance and all the sectoral and line ministries. Uh, some of these things have changed for the best, meaning that there has been an internal strategy of making, uh, dealing with China more um, central in the sense that uh, in this there would be just let's say that it would the focal point would be a, a specific uh, unit or ministry uh, that would deal with China, making it impossible for Chinese actors to um, let's say to push for fragmented negotiations. Uh, and so the, the coordination aspect is something that is very important. Whether it's um, in Senegal, also you know, there's this uh, office for uh, economic perspective that works in collaboration with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in order to you know come up with a coherent strategy. But so in terms of strategies, there are multiple types and multiple styles. Uh, in Benin, uh, the idea now is to set up uh, a memorandum of understanding you know, with China on how, uh, how China should be more uh, compliant with specific norms, you know, setting something like a framework of engaging with China. But, and so you are, there are multiple examples uh, you know, of, of similar initiatives. But the question is always, 
if you only use soft law uh, elements like memorandums of understandings, agreements, uh, strategies, what happens when the next government uh, is elected and you know just decides to change everything? Uh, so the the discussions now are more about how to integrate. Uh, how to make all these strategies, how to find harder forms of, um, you know, uh, agreements that would not be changed should another government come into power. You know, one of the complications um, in in looking at this at, at this summit is the complexity of of of, of kind of unpacking the, the differences between between francophone African you know, kind of priorities and West African priorities. Um, you know, kind of how how do like like do you see differences and or and or coming together between uh, francophone and, and anglophone West African countries? Um, are, are we seeing the emergence of a kind of a more specific kind of West African agenda? You know, in in relation to China. I would say if you ask uh, in your question about Anglophone and Francophone, there are already some structural differences in their relationship with China, meaning that um, when you look at the general patterns of in, in West Africa and China trade, there's a very strong asymmetry, and that is something that is not specific to West Africa. But the trade balance between um, West Africa and China is, is uh, asymmetric, but it's when you make a you know, you look at it, uh, when you break it down, um, it's stronger uh, between Anglophone and Francophone nations, meaning that Nigeria and Ghana are China's top trade partners in terms of exports, you know, to China. They are the top trade partners in the region where Francophone countries like uh, Benin, Mali, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, they export less to China. And in the paper, I have also given some, some data. If you compare this, you would see that, um, you know, countries like uh, Mali only... Uh, it's just 1.9 billion. Uh, Niger is just 800 uh, million, where, uh, where Nigeria is about 20 billion, Ghana 13 billion. Uh, and so there's already this asymmetry. Even Senegal, the host country of FOCAC 8, uh, despite the stock increase in exports to, to China, also lags behind. Uh, and so... This can be explained by a certain number of factors which are not specific to China only, and that's the West African countries largely export raw materials and you know, primary co commodities which are subject to external shocks, and uh, they import mostly uh, manufactured goods. Also, access to the Chinese market is hard, you know, despite recent preferential treatment uh, um, agreements. But I think that... Um, Maybe uh, despite these differences, uh, the priorities are rather similar and the priorities for engaging with China and for um, what they are looking uh, for in this relationship. And for FOCAC 8, this was mostly, again, uh, questions related to health, cooperation, uh, economic recovery and debt that really came out. And uh, then... Uh, other questions related to digital cooperation, especially looking at you know, the Smart Burkina uh, project, also the data center in Senegal. Uh, Benin also uh, is uh, also signed a couple of digital uh, cooperation agreements with uh, with China. I think the only difference here uh, with, with francophone uh, countries, and it's not really a difference, it's a particularity, is that maybe they, uh, countries in the Sahel, like Burkina Faso, uh, Mali, Guinea, Niger, will be looking for corporations that, uh, cooperation agreements that are much more, uh, you know, interconnected, as I mentioned, this uh, intersection between health cooperation uh, and, you know, security cooperation. It's also in, in West Africa that I've uh, seen that there are many agreements uh, or let's say, requests for training from the Chinese um, uh, popular army to come and train military in the region uh, on how to address uh, the pandemic. Uh, because in just like elsewhere, you know, military have been 
largely affected by uh, the pandemic. The case rate is higher than in other parts, uh, than in other uh, parts of the country and, and sectors. One of the themes that you just mentioned, and it's also in your paper, is on the question of debt. Uh, West Africa is actually not one of the major problem areas for Chinese debt in Africa. Ghana, Nigeria, and Cote d'Ivoire are the three top borrowers in West Africa that you detailed in the paper. Nigeria has less than 4% of its $80 billion of debt is due to the Chinese. Ghana, though, interestingly, uh, just this week ran into some problems on the bond markets. The yields on the bond markets are going up a lot because their investors are concerned about the surging levels of debt. Let's talk about debt renegotiations. The Chinese are very keen in all of their talks right now leading up to the summit to avoid any discussion of it. So Wang Yi had a had conversations with both Kenya and Zambian foreign ministers over the past two weeks. Nothing about debt. Obviously, in Zambia and Kenya, it's a pressing issue. There's no talk about it in terms of what we saw from Ambassador Liu, as well as his preview. But you say that debt renegotiations might be a key theme what do you think might happen at FOCAC regarding debt? I think it's very difficult to forecast the outcomes on debt uh, renegotiations for now. I know that it, it's a theme that comes up very often, or at least when I was discussing with all these policymakers, it's a theme that came up very often in terms of what will be discussed. But at the same time, they were mentioning that this will never be public. Uh, meaning that uh, just like in any summits, you have a mix of bilateral meetings and multilateral meetings. And so all the discussions around debt will be behind closed doors. Um, but there, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it, you know, in, in, um, among Africa's top borrowers, you have three West African nations, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, and Côte d'Ivoire. And in 2013, already Ghana and Nigeria were among Africa's top borrowers uh, from China. Um, it is with all the discussions going on, uh, both at the civil society level, uh, but also at the governmental level, it is very likely that uh, you know there will be discussions around uh, maybe debt forgiveness or you know postponing uh, some of the payments. And I think it's more at that level that there might be some announcements, uh, you know, or debt cancellation, but of course not commercial debt. Uh, so that's something that I forecast. But again, this will most likely happen with some specific countries that uh, request it. And, and maybe, you know, that could be uh, uh, Nigeria uh, and, and maybe to some extent Ghana. But I think other African countries outside the region are facing uh, more you know, debt distress and will be more in talks with China uh, about debt and thinking about you know, c- countries like Angola, Zambia, for instance. But you do expect debt to be maybe among the announcements at the end of FOCAC or will be on the agenda at some level? Oh, I, I expect it. And I think uh, it is very likely to be on the agenda. But again, and don't expect exactly don't expect you know official big statements it will you know be uh, very general i think it would be interesting to have conversations afterwards with some of the officials to know uh, you know maybe what has been discussed and what were the discussions that they can share share of course in an anonymous way you, you point out in the paper a really kind of interesting set of, of factors that I hadn't 100% been aware of. Like On the one hand, um, you say that, that West African countries have, have a, quite a high level of trade um, integration um, compared to other parts of the continent because people move so freely back and forth across, across boundaries. But at the same time, there's a lot of there's not a lot of coherence in terms of their their trade relationship with China in the sense that there's different tariffs kind of all over the different all, all over the region, um, and not really a kind of a, a kind of a unified you know kind of approach to, to trade with China. So I was wondering how you see that shifting in the context of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and how the the free trade agreement might hook into or, or like might might feature at the FOCAC discussions. 
Well, I think that the, the AFCFTA, the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, is uh, very much seen uh, in the region, but also on the continent as the blueprint for regional integration uh, um, in Africa and for increasing the trade flows. Uh, and so what has been interesting to see is how countries, not only China, but external partners are, you know, more or less adhering to it, but also in in something that m might look, you know, a bit contradictory to also sign various uh, free trade or at least start discussing free trade agreements and uh, preferential trade agreements. I think in the case of, um, of China, um, there are many questions, especially in the West African region, is that uh, given that they consider free trade as a key policy to the advancement of regional t integration and something that you know, predates, um, I would even say, you know, colonization, it's a region that where there were so many various flows of people and goods, um, China has officially manifested it, its support to the free trade initiative and in, in, you know, lauding it as a win-win solution. But there are also several potential tensions, you know, potential for trade tensions that I highlight in the paper. First one is that there's an import of cheap Chinese goods uh, that have had an impact on sourcing you know, from neighbors. Uh, that's also the case in other regions like East Africa. Uh, but in the West African context, textiles from imports from China is one issue uh, where Chinese imports have directly been a source of tension due to the low prices, uh, competition to locally produced textiles uh, sold by West African women on the regional markets where Chinese uh, goods are also present. Uh, and there have been several uh, regulations to forbid more than a certain percentage of Chinese imported textile, but their presence is still very important on local markets, which shows more a lack of enforcement of existing you know, national regulations than a China problem, uh, because Chinese merchants aren't the only ones selling these goods. It's more and more African businessmen, businesswomen traveling to China, placing orders, uh, allowing Africans to order directly from China. And they are responsible for the presence of uh, and retail of these goods on these markets. Um, and I all I, I often quote you know, my colleague Antoine Kennen who said a few years ago that China has become an African business and that is something that you can see especially in the trade sector. Um, so also, I'm talking here about trade, but I think where China has also expressed specific support to the, the free trade agreement uh, is via infrastructure building to facilitate this trade. And so there's where infrastructure, you know, could take uh, a key key place in how China and uh, African institutions, African governments discuss this because it's about also the transport corridors in support of Africa's trade and industrialization agenda. Uh, railways, you know, so it's like the Benin-Niger railway uh, that are under discussion with Chinese contractors. Uh, and, and, and so, again, linking this to your previous question on debt, it, China might be a little bit more reluctant you know, to lend due to some of the, the, the borrowing countries' high debt ratio um, and a situation that has also been made worse with, with the pandemic. Uh, and that might be also, uh, that will most likely also be on the agenda. I'd like to shift gears a little bit here and focus on the civil society questions. You are actively involved in monitoring civil society perceptions of China. You did it with this paper in the research for this paper, but also your work with AFO Barometer as well. This is a very confusing part of the dynamic for those of us on the outside looking in, because what we see is Africa's governing elites to be 100% fully aligned with China. There's no daylight in between their positions. They say wonderful things about each other. And yet in civil society, on social media, with NGOs, the issues of environmental degradation, labor abuse, maltreatment of workers, uh, the questions of corruption, illegal immigration, illegal mining, all of these roil the, the relationship from the bottom up. Talk to us about what you were hearing on the ground while doing the research, both for this and your work with Afrobarometer, 
on the different perceptions about China from civil society and those of policymakers and governing elites? China-Africa relations are largely uh, organized via government-to-government relations. And so, as you, you said, governmental elites, uh, African policymakers, I have a more positive perception of this relationship, at least publicly, than a civil society. Uh, and again, let, let me just say something about uh, perceptions by government elites. They, they are not you know, 100% positive. Uh, maybe they cannot say it openly, but many are also quite critical uh, about the ways some of these Chinese contractors uh, behave, uh, you know, lack of compliance, non-compliance uh, with uh, environmental, uh, social, uh, construction norms, but also uh, questions related to legal norms. Uh, and so the, I would just like to come back to your, in one, your second question on how uh, this comes to the agenda. Maybe there's where uh, the issue lies is that Man, much of the criticism that comes from the ground uh, and that is channeled at, uh, through the, to, let's say, that is channeled and, and, and said to national officials um, doesn't necessarily make it to uh, the continental uh, position. And so what one policymaker told me is that there are two tracks there's the official track that we know of, but all the criticism are also discussed, but behind closed doors. So I think there needs, there's more investigation that is needed there on how African governments are channeling criticism to their authoritarian partners. Uh, so that, that is something that is, uh, that, that, re, that needs more, um, that needs more research and investigation because Things are happening. However, on the civil society level, uh, as you mentioned, there's m much more criticism. Uh, there's the project uh, in in Sierra Leone, uh, you know, coming back to West Africa, the project in Sierra Leone that has been gathering quite some criticism. You know, the local Chinese uh, fishing plan that is considered as a risk for the destruction of a, a rainforest. There's criticism also in Ghana around the bauxite deal and its. Uh, environmental impacts. I think that, f and that's something that I advised also uh, as part of my recommendation in the paper, is that it's important for African governments who are aware of this criticism to find a way to integrate it more into you know, the agenda. And by bringing in these actors, uh, Afrobarometer has released a very important data uh, on you know, public perception, uh, popular citizens' perception, and the extent to which Chinese uh, popularity has been slipping also a bit in the region. Uh, and so it, I think that it's important to, for African officials to integrate that as well. And in all the preparations for these summits, and even for bilateral meetings, to voice this better in their interactions with China. In, in the paper for Sire, you um, you know there's this the 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 call for for greater integration of civil society actors is is framed within a, a larger call for the integration of 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 a wider range of non-state actors. So I was wondering how African corporations fare in terms of their inclusion in these discussions compared to civil society. How they feel you mentioned. I mean, I I, I I more like to to which extent are they included? Do they and do they feel that they have a voice? With, with within these discussions? Oh, no, they, they don't. They don't. They don't feel that they have uh, a sufficient voice. And I would even say that uh, there is more civil society coordination with traditional partners, uh, you know, with Africa's engagement with traditional partners than uh, with China in terms of, you know, uh, bringing up, uh, you know, having this bottom-up approach. Um, so... Uh, I think it's and it's not only it's not only the, the it's not only civil society. I was using an example of a project that I've been investigating. You know, by how the private sector 
uh, works with China. Uh, it's the Safari Waste Extension and Rehabilitation Project that will connect, you know, Dakar to Tuba. Tuba is a very religious uh, a city in Senegal, and that is executed by China Railways. Uh, and it's interesting to see how these projects that is driven 100% by the Senegalese private sector is able, you know, to negotiate better some clauses of the contract, you know, specific details about local content, use of mater local materials, knowledge transfer, job creation, and they do this in a more specific and advantageous way in some contracts signed uh, than in some contracts signed by the Senegalese government with Chinese contractors. So what I was saying in my writing in my paper is that it is, an, it is to the advantage of uh, West African governments to integrate more of these non-state actors in the way they deal with China and to learn from them. Not only include their criticism uh, and the various criticism that uh, that they are, have been uh, you know, claiming for for the past years now, uh, but also to learn from how other actors that are not necessarily state actors, how they engage with uh, with China and come up maybe with a more inclusive uh, strategy. So it's I only see benefits in bringing in these actors. I want to close our discussion moving away from the Chinese very briefly. You are in Paris now. You've been in France for a while for and you were there for the recent uh, Africa France summit which was very interesting and what we focused on on the show was the dramatic last day of the event in Montpellier in southern France where African youth confronted French President Emmanuel Macron and really gave him an earful, but the summit was much more than what happened just on that last day. It does seem to us, as we have been focusing, that many of the foreign policies from France, China, definitely the United States, are in flux and transition right now. You attended some of the events during the Africa-France summit. What was your impression of what you saw and from the folks you talked to about where the France-Africa relationship is today? Yes. Well, I uh, officially I didn't uh, attend the summit, you know, as a as an invitee, but I've been able to interact with uh, some of the different participants and you know gather also their opinion. Uh, I think there were there are several elements here. First. Um, I think it was a strategic um, decision by the French government to call it, you know, a new summit. Uh, and first of all, calling it a summit. Use these interactions between civil society and uh, governmental leaders are not something new in itself. You know, there's quite some documentation about it. It's called Track 1.5 Diplomacy. It has happened in the past before, but usually it takes the... the um, it it's labeled as a forum, uh, you know, uh, but not as a summit. So calling this a summit is was a strategic way um, to, for at least the French government and the French president to say that, well, these uh, civil society is as important, you know, as leaders. They are the future. It's important to engage with them. Uh, and on the other hand, there will also be another summit, the AU-EU meeting happening uh, early next year. I think it's in February, where the French president will be meeting with African leaders. So this, this, I think this has been, by some of the media, this has been a bit too quickly labeled as, uh, you know, the, the non-importance of African leaders for France anymore. No, I think that the French president is just multiplying a format of engagement. Now, coming to um, to coming to the to what has been discussed and engagement, especially on the final day in Montpellier, engagement between the French uh, president and civil society activists. Um, here again, I don't think that this was something surprising for the French president. It's it's important to to keep in mind that the French and several reports have been published on, by the French National Assembly, by the French uh, Senate, and also by you know some of the French Africa Business Councils who are assessing popularity uh, of 
French actors, uh, and let's say just French uh, popularity in Africa, in Francophone Africa, and seeing how uh this uh, this popularity has been slipping uh you know very very fastly over the past years so um engaging with civil society is also the way i see it was a way of saying let's create a platform and discuss about these topics it's also a way to let's say bring it back to Franco-African spaces because uh, there's been much criticism in France about the way by which countries and actors from Turkey, from Russia are using the neo-colonial discourse, you know, and also sometimes, um, you know, nourishing it via several media platforms uh, in, 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 uh, on the continent and something that is uh, to the detriment of France's Africa policy. So bringing it back to Franco-African spaces is also a way of saying, we hear you, you don't need to discuss it with the others, let's discuss it among ourselves. Um, so that's, the, that's my opinion about you know, this civic uh, and official uh, you know, hybrid engagement. Now, for some of the criticism that I've heard is that it, although it's a um, civic format, um, it was still, ver to some extent, a, a bit too top-down in the ways the agenda was set, which brings me you know, to question also, what are the politics of agenda setting in these uh, hybrid formats? We know quite a lot about official uh, formats. We were talking about FOCAC, but we don't know very much about who sets the agenda, uh, who has more power in uh, agenda setting in these civic formats. And in this case, some of the criticism uh, that came out were that there wasn't very much mutual exchange in some of the panels. Uh, it was more about some of the Afri so, sorry, some of the French uh, private, uh, you know, banks and uh, or investment banks and and some actors trying to teach the Africans how to pitch. Uh, and this was a, this was a bit contradictory because. All the civic leaders that you that you that were there were also very strategically chosen, meaning that many of them are already have successful businesses, you know, and so they were expecting to bring this knowledge to the table and maybe, you know, being asked to teach uh, to the others um, who were present on their success stories and you know having more some of some kind of a mutual exchange uh mutual learning uh, aspect to the to to the civic forum than one that is too top down the article is mapping the future of africa china relations insights from west africa we also got a few insights from france there as well by folashade sule a senior research associate at Oxford University's Blavatnik School of Government. Fodashade, thank you so much for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule. I don't know how you get it all done. Um, if people want to follow what you're reading and writing and you share some excellent things on Twitter, where can they find you on the Twitter? My Twitter handle is Folasule, and they can just DM me directly. Okay, I will put links to the article plus her Twitter handle. And Fulashade, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We're looking forward to seeing what your assessments are after FOCAC and staying in touch with everything that you've been reading and writing. Thank you. Thank you. It has been a pleasure engaging with you again. Kobus, what a treat to be able to speak with Fulashade. For those of you who are not familiar with her work, she is truly one of the rock stars in this business. And it's a rare pleasure to have the chance to speak with her because she, again, has this really interesting mix of Francophone, Anglophone perspectives, Europe, Africa perspectives, China. She's really knowledgeable on negotiation. So she sees this from bottom up, top down, from so many different ways. But I was a little disappointed with what she said about how the negotiations for debt relief are going to happen in private, because those, again, are the kinds of conversations that need to happen in public. They need desperately some of the transparency that is badly missing from this. So news came out today that Zambia's debt is now been 
uh, recalibrated up to, or recalculated is the better the word, up to $27 billion. $6.6 billion of that is owed to China. Think about it that Zambia is an economy that's $19.2 billion, according to the World Bank from last year. So they owe $27 billion. The GDP is $19 billion. So they are now officially way over the danger level. Uh, as we mentioned in the show, Ghana is having difficulties now securing more euro bonds because of their debt levels that are up in the debt servicing. So debt is really one of the most critical issues, especially as the pandemic draws on. Some of the relief that people were expecting in Africa to come from the special drawing rights from the the world, uh, the International Monetary Fund, uh, that's not coming in anywhere near the quantities that people thought. So the rich countries were supposed to hand over Uh, some of their SDRs to poorer countries. That hasn't happened. So right now, we're looking at about $32 billion from the SDRs going to Africa. And one finance minister said that's a drop in the bucket for a continent as large as Africa. And again, this just seems to mirror the low priority that Africa has in global affairs, whether it's on debt relief, SDRs, on vaccines. The Chinese to date have only distributed 71, I think, or 77, sorry, 77 million vaccines. But, you know, that's what, 35, 40 million people in Africa out of a continent of 1.2 billion. So again, it's really quite depressing that these priorities are not moving up. The debt is not being more transparent. And some of the criticisms of the Chinese are healthy for the relationship, and we won't hear any of it. Yes, it's, you know, I think on both sides, there's so much kind of investment in in secrecy around some of these discussions, you know, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate because because it would be extremely helpful if, 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 if more of these details were discussed in, in public. Um, you know, it, it will be very interesting to see how particularly it's couched in the in the folk act language, you know, at the end. Um, and, you know, whether whether any kind of new developments come out around it um you know it's you know because it's it'll be both both this kind of issue of of how debt relief is going to be addressed and then on the other hand how new financing is going to be addressed um and you know the like we didn't touch on this issue with Fulashadi specifically but but we we've been discussing this issue of, of whether there's going to be any kind of financing target being being announced and to you know if so how it's integrated into discussions about debt relief is going to be interesting because most of that financing will be in the form of debt um and if it's not announced then that will be interesting in the context of debt debt relief as well so you know i think that it'll be it'll be interesting either way but let's let's bear in mind that the dynamics in china today are very different than they were in 2018 just in the past few weeks when we've seen the implosion of evergrande power outages now in at least nine provinces causing real disruption to factories and to people's lives and then uh, you know the big issue right now that they're confronting in China is this question of property tax and 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 the idea is that there's a big pushback from people across the country who say we don't want any property tax this is not how you're going to raise money from us okay so focac is existing in that context again it's not operating in a vacuum here so uh, two things can happen here. If the Chinese insist on putting forward a huge number, again, another $60 billion number where they somehow concoct a stew of, you know, previously committed budgets, new budgets, some export credits, you know, and they, they somehow come up to a $60 billion number. If that number is not censored in Chinese media, it's going to be very upsetting to a lot of people who feel that the economy now cannot justify spending tens of billions of dollars on development in Africa. The other option is they might do what they did in 2018, which was soon after the FOCAC 60 billion number was announced, there was a lot of outrage in China about it, and they started censoring it. China's ability to censor information now is far more advanced, far more sophisticated than it was even three years ago. So we have another option is that they announce a number and they just black it out for everybody in China. So they literally don't know what happened. But there's a complex political dance that has to happen here on the Chinese domestic side. And I'm not so sure that people in Africa fully understand that and appreciate the complexities that Wu Peng, Xi Jinping, the policymakers at the senior level are under in terms of their own constituents and how they may not be in much of a, uh, you know, much of a mood to be spending huge amounts of money in Africa. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, the other the other thing that I think will be really interesting to to focus on will be peace and security. You know, kind of as as uh, Falashara pointed out, there's a lot of a lot of security challenges in West Africa, um, and it's also a space where France is very involved. It's you know, it's 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 a kind of a crowded space there. So, um, and there's been over the the last few FOGAC summits, there's been increasing commitments to Chinese involvement in in, in African peace and security. On the one hand, it, through training but on the other hand through actual you know troop, troops on the ground under multilateral institutions so seeing how that's going to work out in in a space where it's quite fraught you know like where mali is in, is is a situation where the sahel is a situation where you know there's there's a lot of guinea as well you know, yeah a lot of a lot of trafficking a lot of pi- like piracy a lot of terrorism you know so it's a complicated security landscape um so you know it'll be fascinating to see what exactly you know what kind of engagements exactly they will be because I think there will be definitely be pressure from the African side for greater engagement, I think. And that, of course, is one of the areas where the United States remains very strong through its AFRICOM relationships. It's one of the key pillars of the current U.S. foreign policy in Africa is military engagement. So aid and military are the two, what I would call the two main pillars. Trade is largely non-existent. I, I, I saw an interesting statistic as we were covering uh, the Turkish president's visit of to Togo, Angola, and Nigeria this week. I looked up Turkish Africa trades at twenty six billion. America or U.S. Africa trade is at thirty two billion a year. So literally, a, a country that has the GDP the size of the state of Illinois has almost a comparable trade balance with Africa as the United States. Incredible to me, and I think that's more reflection on the United States than it is on Turkey. So. Good on you, Turkey, but at the same time, the United States really is not a a major trading power. On that security side, uh, just a little bit of background there. So China has been a very active supporter of the African Union's Rapid Reaction Force, which has been active in the Sahel. Also, it's it's playing a very important role in, in Guinea right now by at least, again, they were very quick to condemn the, the coup. And that was very interesting. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see if that pops up as a point of tension. One other question that came to me today, Kobus, and I'd like to get your take on it, is that it is highly unlikely. And I, when I mean highly unlikely, I mean ninety nine point nine 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 percent unlikely that uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping will go to Dakar. It is a summit, so there will be heads of state there. But what does it mean? When Cyril Ramaphosa is going to fly, what is it, nine hours, eight hours from, uh, you know, from Pretoria up to Dakar to sit and watch Xi Jinping on a screen? What's the point of that? And so we're going to have all of these African leaders get together in a big giant room to watch a Zoom call with Chinese President Xi Jinping, who's not going to be there probably. The Chinese president has backed out of the Glasgow summit in uh, Scotland. He's backed out of the uh, G20 summit in Rome. He is not going to meet Biden one on one. He'll do it by video conference. So there's that's why I say I'm almost 100 percent confident that he's not going to make his first trip outside of China in 600 plus days to go to Dakar. So what kind of summit is it where African leaders are there, but the Chinese leader isn't? Yeah, well, you know, kind of it's in a, in some kind of ways a normal summit, you know, in, in the sense in the sense that that African leaders frequently don't get to to meet the the head of state, you know, kind of on 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 the partner country side, you know, that's that's very very common in on the U.S. side, for example, you know, that that the U.S. president isn't available to meet, and then they end up meeting with the the Secretary of State or or so on, and I think that will probably be the case in this case too. You know, I, I you know I, I expect um, uh, you know people like Wang. Yi to be there um you know so so yeah you know it's, it's not it's not a perfect situation uh but you know that's where we are yeah i think the chinese missed a big opportunity here because what i think they could have done and maybe they'll still do because we don't know anything about what's going on but to have a virtual leader summit so where she is on par with everybody else so all of the heads of state get together on a video conference one week before say for example and then the following week is the ministerial summit where all the foreign ministers go. So Wang Yi is meeting with his peers and, and Yang Jiechi as well from the Politburo. So that, that would make more sense to keep that equity in the, in the relationship. 
Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, we, we should keep in mind that FOCAC hasn't always been a summit. Um, you know, it, it started off, early early FOCAC meetings started off as, as ministerials. Um, That's right. And, you know, kind of, and they were upgraded to summits. And, and there was actually, um, I think it was it's one, uh, either Joburg or Beijing 2015 or 20. 18, there was pressure from the Chinese apparently to to keep it at the ministerial level and then pressure from the Africans to to bump it up to summit level um, and that ended up being successful you know so so the, the, so the, even within the the folk act space there's always this kind of negotiation around ministerial or summit um, and in this case it's a kind of a hybrid I guess we and we won't actually know maybe until we see the logo and the official branding of it because I've started to see in some of the Chinese literature on this, they are creeping the word ministerial back into it again. And as you pointed out, that is something that has not happened for a number of years. So this might be a reorienting of the relationship. We will see. We don't know. There's so much we don't know. Once again, uh, our sources are telling us November 28, 29. Please take that with a grain of salt. Don't go betting on that. But it is the best indication that we have that it's going to happen around then. It could happen in December as well. Most likely it'll be sooner than later, only because we're seeing now the ramping up of all these events in China that usually are the precursor for the summit to come within a month, month and a half. I recall in the last summit in 2018, you went to the think tank forum, right? Yes. What was it like? What did they do at a think tank forum in, in a FOCAC think tank forum? Very staged. Um, it was. It was. It was very formal. It was, uh, uh, so many people. It was a huge event. Um, it was held in these. Um, in in one of those kind of very beautiful kind of like guest house complexes in Beijing. You know, kind of where it's like a like open grounds with like a lake and and, and so on. It's really beautiful. Um, so it was very formal. There were lots of little little um, short presentations from. Uh, a myriad of different think tank people, um, all very formalized, each the same length, you know, kind of with not a lot of kind of free discussion or almost no free discussion, actually. Um, so, so it was super interesting to see as a kind of a pageant and as a, as a you know, as a, as a kind of a moment to attend. But I didn't find it particularly kind of informative information wise, you know, kind of simply because the talking points were so polished um, and on both sides so polished. So, so there was a very, a very studious like avoiding of controversy. Oh, that, yeah, um, that's the way they do these and, things. And, you know, so, so in that sense, yeah, yeah, you know, kind of, I think, I think it can fit into the, the larger kind of folk vibe. Yeah, that that's sense. the way they do these things. So, well, let's leave the conversation there. What a treat again to talk to Foley Sade and, and really to start thinking about FOCAC. It is coming. Uh, we're going to, we're going to cover this from a lot of different angles. We mentioned at the beginning of the show, this LSE Ideas article that has all of these amazing scholars and analysts who contributed to that. In the month of November, we're going to be meeting with most of them on the show. So we're going to be doing mostly FOCAC shows coming up in November to try and help give you a multifaceted view of everything that is going on at different levels. Also, we're going to be talking to uh, some social uh, socialist and progressive and labor leaders coming up as well. We want to try and provide as many alternative perspectives and views on China-Africa relations leading up into the summit coming uh, between now and the end of November. And we'll keep going into December if the summit isn't in November. So that'll do it for this edition of the show. I cannot recommend enough that you try out a subscription to the China Africa Project now more than ever to get ready for FOCAC. Just go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. You get a free 30 days so you can try it out. And if you're not happy with it, then you can cancel it right before FOCAC. But we think you're going to like it because it's got thousands of articles in our archive. Every article is organized by either country or category or keyword, so it's very easy to do research and to search for things. Uh, we're so thrilled to hear that universities around the world are using it in their courses this fall to talk about FOCAC, so thank you to all the professors who are using the uh, the, the site and the newsletter in their courses this, uh, you know, this semester, so that's really exciting for us to hear. And also quite a few journalists are using it as well in their coverage. So give it a try. Once again, ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Also, if you want to join our new community over 
on Patreon, where we're doing happy hours and Zoom calls, and we've got swag, and we've got all these cool things, weekend reviews, new products, lots of cool discussions going on over on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash China Africa Project. Okay, I'll leave the promotions there. We will be back again next week with another episode. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. Mm-hmm.